from London. This is The Standard Podcast, and I'm Mark Blunden. Coming up, pound falls again, and UK borrowing costs hit a new high as Rachel Reeves returns from China into an economic storm. But first, the Prime Minister has unveiled the government's AI Opportunity Action Plan in a bid to make Britain a world leader in the artificial intelligence sector. Sakir Starmer's plan will take forward all 50 recommendations made by tech entrepreneur Matt Clifford, who was commissioned by Science Secretary Peter Kyle to identify AI opportunities. They include the creation of AI growth zones to accelerate planning approvals for data centres, build a new supercomputer and, controversially, allow tech firms to train AI on anonymised health data. So far, £14 billion has been committed by tech firms. It's forecast that these data centres might create 12,000 jobs amid growing concerns about the impact of the march of AI in many other sectors. Sakir claimed that the nation's productivity could be doubled by artificial intelligence in less than five years as we become what's described as an AI superpower, no less. It's a force for change that will transform the lives of working people for the better. So if you're sitting around the kitchen table tonight, worried about the opportunities at your children's school, AI can help teachers plan lessons tailored to your children's specific needs. If you're worried about waiting times, aren't we all? AI can save hundreds of thousands of hours lost to missed appointments because it can identify those on the list most likely not to turn up and help get them the support that they need, maybe change for a more convenient appointment. It can spot potholes quicker, speed up planning applications, reduce job centre form filling, help in the fight against tax avoidance and almost halve the time that social workers spend on paperwork. That's the Prime Minister speaking at University College London, and he was asked by reporters about concerns over NHS patient data privacy. It is important that we keep control of that data. I completely accept that challenge, and we will also uh, do so. But um, I don't think that we should um, have a defensive stance here that will inhibit the sort of breakthroughs that we need. To discover more about today's announcements, our AI future and what it means for the workplace, the Standard Podcast's Rachel Abbott spoke with Dr Mark Kennedy, Associate Professor of Strategy and Organisational Behaviour at Imperial College Business School, and he's also Director of Imperial's Data Science Institute. Dr Kennedy says he welcomes the announcement, but much more investment will be needed. What we need to do in addition to these financial investments and, and policy statements is really think about you know having the mindset to embrace these new things. It, you know, change is difficult no matter where you are, you know, where you're from, who you are. And I, I get that we would be reluctant to think about, you know, why do we need to do anything different? But if we can, can work on that gently without a bunch of finger wagging and make progress at getting people to sort of see the glass as more half full or to see this as something that really offers a lot of promise rather than something that just introduces a lot of hassles and change into life. That will make a difference. Will companies need their own personalized AI center? That's a great question. You know, to what extent does every company need to, you know, duplicate all of this versus will there be either vendors or platforms that people can tag into that will enable them to ride on the waves of investment. And it's going to be a bit of both. I mean, you know, I am familiar with efforts underway here and 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 really well developed by UK businesses to develop, for example, their own large language models to make them more productive in different things that people are doing, especially with written communication with customers and clients and business to business relationships. So you know, that's that's an area where, yes, uh, you know, businesses are already doing those things and putting them to work and seeing significant advantages. Um, and that will be increasingly something that we can say, okay, here's the playbook for that. This is where you do it. And this is where you leave it to the market. I would say most businesses are still working out that playbook. Where are the job losses going to hit worse? I think there's a, a misunderstanding about the effect that AI will have. Very few jobs are amenable to replacement by AI. Because a job fundamentally is a bag of tasks. Most job descriptions have bullet points in them that are the list of different things that you're meant to do, responsibilities that you have. And, you know, very few people have a job that basically says, you do this one thing. Most people do quite a few things. 
And that's a legacy of kind of the information office and uh, automation information revolution that we've been through over the last generation or two. Uh, we've combined a lot of things that previously would have been done in, even in administrative work in a kind of an assembly line mode where papers kind of move from desk to desk around an office and that things just don't work that way anymore. So what that means is that AI is very likely to reduce the amount of time that people need to spend on a particular task within their jobs. And once that time is reduced, we're going to figure out what other tasks should they do because nobody's really just going to be given a, why don't you take the day off, you know, and come back next week because we, you've already finished all the other things because AI is making your life easier. So it won't work that way. Where are the tasks that will be most affected? Well, up until now, it would have been, you know, people would think about tasks that are lower skilled, lower paid elements of work. But amazingly, unusually, it's a major challenge to deal with this. AI is very good at doing things that take a lot of training to be able to do and are typically done by higher paid, higher skilled, so to speak, workers. So unlike previous technologies that have really impacted jobs, this one is going to impact task by task across the earning spectrum and across the level of education spectrum, and it is going to have much more broad-based effects. What are the dangers of giving tech firms access to NHS health data? Anytime we give data away, even when we've worked very hard, or even just make it accessible, even when we've worked very hard to anonymize it, there are patterns whereby you can de-anonymize the data. My colleague, uh, Yves Alexandre de Marjois at Imperial, who's in the Data Science Institute and also in computing, leads a computational privacy group that are experts in that and showing how we can use the tools that we, that we build to try to protect people to also how we can protect the intellectual property of things that, that people have produced and are then learned by systems. So, you know, I, I think the risk of liberalizing access to data is that you will find that you know, you've run afoul of privacy protections that we should care about. But the risk of locking everything down so hard that you don't have those problems is that you don't innovate. This latest move is going to introduce some challenges, but I think it's a step in the right direction. We all need to be vigilant about the responsible use of data. Let's go to a quick break. Coming up in part two, our political editor, Nicholas Cecil, examines why the pound has fallen again. And as UK borrowing costs hit a new high, what does this mean for the Chancellor's future? If you're new here, please do make sure to hit follow and give us a rating. Welcome back. Chancellor Rachel Reeves was flying back from China into an economic storm as the pound lost further ground against the dollar and the cost of long-term government borrowing hit a new high early on Monday. For analysis on the current economic situation, we're joined by the London Standard's political editor, Nicholas Cecil. After last week's fall for the pound, what's happening with sterling on Monday? This morning, Monday morning, we've seen a further fall in the value of the pound. So it's lost about half a cent uh, in the morning to trade about just over one21 dollars. And if you look at the cost of government borrowing, that is actually going up again. So if you're looking at government borrowing over 10 years, that's a, a new high since um, 2008. And if you look at the longer term borrowing over 30 years, that's a, a new high over 27, 28 years. So it's more economic woes for the UK and for the government and for Chancellor Rachel Reeves. On government borrowing and spending, that knock-on impact, what do we know about the risk to mortgage rate rises this year? Well, the concern here is that eventually this will feed through into higher mortgage rates, partly because you know, inflation is looking like it's going to be stubbornly high as well, which means that the Bank of England possibly may cut interest rates maybe once this year rather than twice or even three times. So basically the cost of government borrowing will feed through into the wider economy eventually, partly also because it has such a big impact on public services and the public finances. Where are these government borrowing costs currently highest? To be fair to the government, this is not all the government's doing. Um, certainly uh, a significant factor is the arrival of Donald uh, Trump as US president uh, later this month. That has sent um, economic ripples and economic problems already kind of spreading around the globe. 
One of the reasons is that is he's proposing tariffs on imports into America, some very hefty tariffs for some countries, and that is seen as likely to hit trade. And it's one of the reasons why some countries' cost of borrowing is going up. Britain has been harder hit than many other countries, and there are possibly a couple of reasons for this, uh, certainly to mention. One is the budget, which Rhys' budget last year has proved really controversial. She increased taxes by £40 billion or so, including a £25 billion tax hike on employers through raising national insurance. She also borrowed another £30 billion or so more to basically to spend some £70 billion more on public services, for example, to fix the NHS. The NHS is clearly broken. Dreadful stories coming out of hospitals of waits of up to two days now for treatment, including corridors and so on. So Rees uh, took a bold move to do a big budget, but that has not gone down well in some circles. So that's one factor, uh, which is a UK-specific factor behind this rise in the cost of government borrowing. There's also Brexit. There's a view that Brexit has um, left the UK particularly vulnerable to this kind of economic uh, woes developing, partly because we're not kind of tied together with a bigger economic um, region as we were when we were part of the EU. There was... Much criticism for Rachel Reeves flying to China for what critics said was arguably an underwhelming deal, the £600 million deal. She's flown back now to something of an economic storm. How secure is her job at number 11? Does she still have the full backing, full confidence of the administration. Yes, yeah, so there's some wild speculation around that she she's about to lose her job. I don't think that's likely to happen, certainly not in the short term. The Prime Minister was asked about this this morning after a speech on artificial intelligence, and he said, in his view, she's doing a fantastic job, and he said she had his full confidence. Now, that there are people out there who will dispute that she's doing a fantastic job. I don't doubt that at the moment she has the Prime Minister's confidence and that she is certainly the same job for a decent time still. Interestingly, he didn't say that she would remain Chancellor for the whole of the Parliament, but that is a pledge that Prime Ministers very rarely make. And that's The Standard. For the latest news, head over to standard.co.uk. This podcast is back on Tuesday at 4pm.